the Sports Vote Campaign Podcast. Invest in sports. Hello and welcome back. Today is Super Bowl 55, Sunday, February 7, 2021. We have a concept that's been on the board for more than a decade called open market, which is allowing public uh, revelation of data, of our market data, so that the world will know who's trading what. The amount of that disclosure was never really totally nailed down. Uh, You know, how public do you want to make the individual trader information and that sort of thing? But I do think something like this is important, especially going into the future, to cut down on fraud, such as what we just saw with this Reddit Robinhood GameStop pump and dump. Uh, This is one of the biggest financial frauds in modern history, and you're going to see lots of regulatory activity and lawsuits come out of this. Uh, Robinhood, since the last uh, podcast, Robinhood actually had to raise at least twice multi-billion dollar uh, fundraises. This is to cover a shortfall. Uh, That means they didn't have capital on hand to cover the trades. That's against the rules. Um, So this is going to unwind over time, and it may even threaten the very existence of Robinhood as an entity. So we'll see where that goes. We're talking again about possibly allowing esports to be the uh, first um, league fundraise. Esports in that it's not a physical presence, not meaning a a companion product such as, uh, you know, say NASCAR has a physical presence and then NASCAR online. This would be purely uh, like video game leagues. Um, I've left this really up to Alper. Um, As I've said in the past, uh, you know, I I defer this decision to him if he thinks it can be worked out um, and work. You know, as our first example, I think that this reduces the friction um, because esports leagues don't obviously require stadiums and all this other physical stuff. And without a doubt, in this modern age, we are living in a time when there are two worlds. Um, there's there's a physical world and an, and an electronic world and Uh, You know, which one is more important, which one is bigger, uh, it's hard to say at this point. So if that turns out to be uh, doable, it will vastly expand the the universe in which we can reach out to find this first league uh, to fundraise. And one of the issues that we've come into talking to potential prospects about uh, doing the first physical league fundraise is is COVID-19. As mentioned uh, several months ago, the Celebrity League idea, that that has been passed around, but the question that comes back is uh, COVID-19 issues. So that's that's an impediment that would not be the case uh, if if it's determined that we can do this with esports. So I'm going to continue to say this over and again, that gambling uh, on versus investing in is our principal proposition. Investing in gambling is an investment in the past. It's not an investment in the future. It's an investment in the past. Um, You know, sports performance investing is the future. It's just a matter of getting the word out. And getting the word out is really just uh, a matter of getting the first fundraise done and publicized. So the gambling uh, folks are hyping like crazy, as they always do right before Super Bowl. It's as predictable as the sunrise. As I said on the last um, podcast, the... Sands uh, Group is revenues were down revenues, not profits. You can play games with profitability numbers. That's accounting tricks. I'm talking about top line revenues. We're down 70 percent. Um, DraftKings should be reporting here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, they've obviously put everything they possibly can into the news cycle to pump the stock price up, uh, including bringing in a new investor and hyping that up. Uh, I'm saying this. And, and you'll be able to come back to this podcast in the future to see that it's the case. No matter how much money they throw at this, because the existence of the UK market and the uh, Costa Rican market, they're not going to find a profit. And, and here's why. The UK market is the most uh, sophisticated, long-standing, experienced players. They, that's where they are. And then the Costa Rican uh, entities are the tax-free side of it. So you have this hyper-regulated side. Um, I wouldn't say hyper-regulated, but regulated side, the UK, which has had a long uh, history of this of this industry. And then you have the, the Costa Rican side and, and equivalent, but Costa Rica is still the monster in the space, um, that have no tax and reporting. So that's going to be your competition. 
uh, at the end of the day for what bet you know what the best lines are in the in the most generous profit or most generous bonus offers and those things. So no matter how much they push the the much money they push into this, they're not going to find a profit in the marketplace. These entities are going to lose money and lose money and lose money and lose money. And they have been. Just look at the results. Okay. In fact, losing money at a greater rate every quarter. So revenue is not profit also. And I'm also looking at the way they're presenting the numbers, trying to say, you know, all the revenues are not, are up. Okay. Revenues are up doesn't matter. What matters is what is the profitability because each time the DraftKings has had a higher revenue number, they've had an even higher loss factor, not just at the same rate either, a higher loss at a higher rate of loss. So sure, you can hype like crazy. You can play stock market games. You can, you know, um, hype, 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 and get people to think they're missing out on not buying this stock. But at the end of the day, these companies are bleeding cash. DraftKings has lost almost about a billion dollars in the last 12 months. Just look for yourself. That's a billion dollars out the door. Now, where did they find that money? They took it in from the stock market. Now, if that's an okay business model with you, fine. I mean, play the DraftKings stock and have a good time. But that's not a business. That's a scam. Okay? At the end of the day, that's a scam. So the Wire Act, we're not letting this go. I'm never going to let this go. This is a 60-year-old, 1961. This is a 60-year-old super precedent. And when I was in Costa Rica, I didn't even know what PASPA was. I don't ever remember us even talking about PASPA. But the Wire Act was the mortal threat because the Wire Act can be used to bring in RICO charges and all these other things. And I remember the gambling operators down there being an absolute mortal terror of the Wire Act. And that law is still 100% in place and restated recently. So... We'll see where this goes with this new administration and the Justice Department and, and the way they look at this. It's yet to be determined, and anything you hear to the contrary is purely a lie because nobody knows with these this far-right um, uh, court system, federal court system, and this Democratic administration. Those are two opposites right off the bat. Nobody knows where this is going yet. So, yes... Uh, our march has been uh, difficult. You know, we've had to lose battles along the way to win the greater war. That's that's uh, often how it goes when you're playing for big stakes. You know, we invented the concept of sports performance investing. There's no way around that. Uh, I can prove it with gigabytes of data going back uh, almost 20 years. Um, you know, this is a new concept, whereas betting on sports is a very old concept. And I will tell you this, and I've said it before, there's been at least $100 million that I can point to that has been spent trying to steal this idea, starting when we were in Costa Rica. Um, if you look in the ASM notice board, I've got them lined out there who the major ones were. The most recent one was Fantex. Uh, they all spent that money, at least $100 million, that's publicly, uh, you, can, you can prove it through public records. Uh, and they failed. So we're we're it, okay? There's nobody else around. Uh, there are people that have tried to steal little pieces here and there, but we we have eyes everywhere. So if you try to copy this cons model as it exists, as we have it filed for patent all around the world, you're going to get contacted by somebody from our company. So yes, it's a moonshot. Yes, it's difficult. Um, you know, go. I go back to the uh, discussion of of tablet computing. I was in the computer business in the 1990s. In the early 1990s, there were several attempts, even by Apple, remember the Newton, okay, to get the uh, the tablet market off the ground. And it just didn't stick. It didn't stick until Apple came along. So, yes, it sometimes takes a very long time to to get the public uh, to the point where they're ready to accept your product. It's, it's not just the de development of the product, but it's market timing as well. Uh, we have something here. I, I I just know it. it. There's no way we'd have been able to keep it alive this long, especially through these incredible events like the 2008 Great Recession, and now we have this downturn from this hundred-year pandemic. Uh, you know, and yet we still are here. So uh, it's just a matter of getting that first fundraise done, and then publicizing it. We have the tools to do that. We have the contacts. We know how to do it. So that's all it is. That's really the trigger for everything. Um, Alper is working on a, a new lead in Europe. That's as much as I can say right now. Um, 
you know, when there's more to say, we'll talk about that. It's too early to speak about it in any detail, and on his request, that's as far as I can go. So as far as trading the stock market, and this stock market is a bubble like nothing I've ever seen. Something's going to prick it at some point. Um, all the people who I follow that are in the stock market and have been for decades are just saying, hold on, because it's coming. And yes, you can invest in crypto, you can invest in tobacco, you can invest in cannabis, you can invest in DraftKings and booze and all these other vices and so forth, and you might make quite a bit of money. That is not what we are doing here. That's your choice. If you want to play those games and, and, and make money and that's your only measure of success, then good, good luck. You, know, that, that you can also uh, you know, invest in murder for hire, just go on the dark web. Your money and your attention show your true allegiances. That's not what we're doing here, okay? I, I personally know what it feels like to have early success in life, and I, I have been responsible for many millions of dollars generated through many different projects. I, that is not the game I'm playing here. I made the decision over a decade ago, really about 15 years ago, when I really understood what this was, that I was going to dedicate my energies and efforts to making this thing work out. For the sake of change, no matter how well it does, it's never going to make me rich because I don't have a stake in it. I mean, the, the records will show that it, it's it's in my bankruptcies. You know, I have to disclose all that stuff. You're free to go to the pacer and look it all up for yourself. I do not have any claims on the stock. I am not hiding that from anybody. I don't have anybody holding it for me. Uh, the only batch that is there is the batch that goes to the nonprofit, but the nonprofit will be subject to rules about what it can pay me if I'm still working for it. So there's no payday for me. The payday is to see change, to, to see a change. That's my dedication. That's why I'm willing to suffer personal bankruptcy twice, twice, okay, on account of ASM directly. Um, and those, those, effects, negative effects, had no impact on the stockholders in both cases. I was able to insulate the business from that and take all that on myself personally. Dealing with this Leon injustice, which by the way is pending in both state and federal court, has been a personal issue, which was not, uh, it's not, not because of something I got personally, and it's not, it's not to my benefit. It's just a cost, okay? It's a cost of having to stand in this role and continue to drive this forward. I kept all of this stuff away from the stakeholders. Every Everybody who has a stock grant or the tiny number of people who actually made direct purchases when we had the private placement uh, out, which we did register, by the way, in spite of what may be out there in the public domain, uh, there are sales through that private placement on top of the grants. Those were never harmed by that, by these, um, these, these cases. So uh, anyway, I just think it's important that you understand my motivation here. My motivation is is to see this through, and 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 I feel responsible to the stakeholders to to see it through, no matter what, and uh, to a greater degree even than that to uh, affect the change in the world that I think that this will bring. So uh, what you spend your money on right now is more important now than ever in terms of. Uh, what it means, okay? There's not a lot of money in circulation, so where your money goes is uh, is really important. So, you know, if you're all about just make as much money as possible, then then by all means, go out there and, and do whatever you want, but that you're, you're making a false comparison to what's going on here. Okay, so games versus useful markets. There's a lot of games out there related to sports, and there's even some uh, that look like they're trying to copy elements of our model, but they are framed up as games. We are not a game, okay? This is not a game. This is about a platform, a new a new platform and financial instrument so that sports teams can raise money by selling interest in their sports performance, okay? Sports performance investing, that's what we're about. So, uh it's not a game. It's not intended to be a game. It's not in, it's has it's not a it's not gambling. It's none of that. It's a useful tool for the sports industry. That's its principal purpose. So, um Venice, California. So I have not been down there uh, at least a year. It's been at least a year since I've been down there, since before the pandemic started. And I had no idea how far this deteriorated. Um, it's it's really awful down there, what's going on. My point of bringing this up is that this is really um, a, 
uh, an example of the wealth gap writ large. You know, there are always places where you can find the highlights of what's going on in the broader economy. And when I mean the broader economy, I'm not just talking about the U.S., I'm talking about the world. And Venice, California, I think, is an extreme example of the disparity between uh, the haves and the have-nots. So you have people who pay uh, millions upon millions. I mean, the average price is like $3 million, $4 million for a beach house that's about the size of a small apartment. And then you have a homeless encampments that are literally blocking the doors. It's nuts. Um, so... As goes California, so goes the world, okay? And you can like that or dislike it. I've watched it my entire life. Remember, I grew up in Louisiana where I, to this day, when I go back there, I have to listen to people crack on California. In spite of the fact that I've lived here almost six years, they want to tell me more about the place I lived and and they've never even visited. (laughs) It's pretty hilarious. But I've watched California drive innovation and and the good, the bad, the ugly of society, the the positives, the negatives. It's the leading edge, okay? I, I've said in a prior podcast, it's the leading edge of the American dream. I totally believe that's the case. It's also the leading edge of the problems, okay, where, where they manifest. And if you want to see wealth gap uh, to, to, I think, probably the most extreme case in the world, it's Venice, and what's happening over there. You can Google uh, or just go to YouTube and there's plenty of man on the street videos. I I had been, I mean, I haven't been down there, like I said, in a, probably about 18 months now, a little closer to that. And uh, I, it was nothing like this. I mean, yes, you might've seen a tent or two on a side street, but now they're spilled out onto the beach. They're in on the boardwalk. Um, I mean, I know that place. I've, I've been there many times. It's incredible. Um, so, we have to solve this. I mean, you know, this wealth gap issue is is the, is the problem uh, that's causing all of this stuff, including the political uh, fractions and all the, you know, factions and fighting and all this stuff. Um, crypto and gambling are parasites, okay? I'm not letting this go. Nobody has ever built anything in this world on gambling, on a gambling enterprise. It just doesn't happen. You want to call me out on this? Show me, okay? Las Vegas, been there more times than I can count. City of the now at this point it's a pretty sad place, but in the past when it was really rocking, sure you have all these bright lights and sparkly stuff and and all this activity and noise and shows and all this on the on the boardwalks and such and Las Vegas Boulevard, but just drive a little bit outside of that. I mean this was covered in Back to the Future, you know Biff's Pleasure Palace, which we actually did a video on this. If you go to our video um, on our YouTube, <laughs> we have this uh, covered. You know. Sure, you have all this, pro- what looks like prosperity and all this in the middle, and then you have nothing but, tr- you know, destruction. That's all you're going to get from gambling expansion. Um, do do your own research. Look in, look in other places. There's literally not a single example of gambling doing anything other than being a parasite. Crypto is the same thing. It doesn't produce anything. It's it's and to say it produces money means you don't understand what money is. Okay, money is a byproduct. Money is not. It's a social contract. It's a construct. Okay, it is not producing anything. Show me an example of of forget millions of jobs. Show me an example of thousands of jobs being created by crypto. Show show me an example of that. It it doesn't exist. These things are just machinery to create. Uh, money out of thin air, which will vanish just as fast. In the case of sports performance investing, and I'm not going to let this go, it will create millions of jobs, millions around the world, basically forever, okay? It will create millions of jobs around the world forever, okay? And my saying this doesn't benefit me to one time. I mean, if tomorrow ASM became as valuable as, as Apple or Microsoft, yeah, I would be in no different place than I am right now. I mean, it would it would not be the day that I buy a Bentley and 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 a house on the hill somewhere. I'm saying this because I believe it to be true, and I've done the research over the last more than a decade, and I'm going to prove all that out in the in the coming volumes, volume one and volume two of this book that are um, being written right now. The first volume coming out July 4th, the second um, J- uh, December 25th of this year, 2021. So ASM is a, an infrastructure jobs plan. It is a make the world a better place plan. That's, that's my commitment, and that's the commitment of the core team. 
The other people that are interested because there are parties and it's exciting come and they go. I've now seen two cycles of this. I won't be fooled a third time. I know who's real and I know who's fake. So, yes, this is a moonshot. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, there's never been a guarantee of success. But for the first time, I see all of the pieces in place, including the need. So all we need is just one league to finance anywhere in the world, anywhere. And and again, we're looking back at the esports not as an esports that's combined with physical sports, but standalone as a potential uh, example. If Alper says it works, if it works, and he's comfortable that we can make it work, I, I have my concerns about it because I've been in the computer business all my life, and we're going to have to be very careful about um, manipulation and things. You know, look at all this stuff about the voting machines and such. All that now, th those things had paper tabulations with them, but there's always questions when there's not physical uh, items, right? Things that you can grab and touch. Uh, so I think we have to deal with that carefully if the decision is yes. But, you know, financing an esports league is just financing a bunch of people that have their computers already probably in their house. Uh, maybe every once in a while you put them together in a stadium somewhere. Uh, you don't really have a crowd involved. I mean, there, there's it really reduces this, the friction. So uh, really, that's all we need to, 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 to do is find the first one and then route it out to the, to the media, to the mainstream media, which I still 100% believe in. It's, it's been the, the number one um, method for us to get the word out. And I know you know that. You know, people that have been tracking us have seen us. We've been very effective with the media. So that's uh, when we have that story, when we have that look, we have this example here and we take that to the press, that's going to light it up. And it's going to bring all the pieces together. So that's where all the focus goes. Any other ex expenditure of, of energy and, and time is really a waste. This is the, this is the game winner for, for us to bring it all together. And again, I will say that once that happens and the, and the company matures, and I don't know how long this will take. I mean, look at Apple's path, right? It's taken a long time. But it will, it will become the, the biggest company in the history of the world. It, just because I know what the turnover will be. I know what the profitability will be. It will just expand and expand and expand and expand. So uh, the, the, the prize, um, you know, for our stakeholders, obviously, the more valuable the company becomes, the more valuable their stake becomes. I'm all for that. Um, I want to see that happen. I, whatever, whatever each individual investor's desire is, I'd love to see that happen for them. Um, but for me, it's the social side of it. I'm driven by that. I'm driven by the desire to make change, to suppress gambling, because I know how destructive, I know from personal experience and examples of how destructive it is, never mind the data, which clearly shows the same thing. Um, I want to see that squashed, and I want to see uh, sports investing take over, and, and, and because I know it will be a net win for the world, basically forever. So that's what this is all about. So interestingly, I got an invitation to um, resubmit an SBA loan. Uh, this is actually for my personal services company, not for ASM. And I put it aside and then I went back to it um, because I thought actually I was disqualified and I'm not, uh, which what this will do is just allow me to divert more resources towards ASM because whatever comes in to my personal services company, I'm going to deploy right back out on ASM. That's what I've done from the start. Uh, so uh, there were three qu three questions on there that kind of struck me as interesting. Um, you know, gambling, questions about whether your income is derived from gambling or anything related to pornography or anything related to cannabis. So why are they asking those questions? Let me ask, answer that for you. Because they are all three still federally illegal, okay? This was an SBA document from just a week ago, okay? And on that questionnaire is, are your, is your income derived from gambling, anything connected to pornography, or anything con connected to cannabis? So if that doesn't tell you the true state of things, in spite of what's being enforced at the moment, then you really don't understand how the law works, because they wouldn't ask these questions if they weren't legally relevant. So Section 230 bill is being put up. Section 230, I think, is a disaster. I mean, where else in this world can you lie through your teeth and hurt people and cause uh, uh, damage without any uh, accountability? It's ridiculous. Um, the liars, scoundrels, and scumbags have caused 
me problems, have caused many other people problems, have caused destruction of value in companies. There are now multi-billion dollar lawsuits against Fox News and others because of their lies. And I mean, it's the day of reckoning is coming. Okay, you should never have been able to put out false information without accountability. That is just wrong. That's not free speech. That's slander and defamation. Oh, I mean, you can say what you want, but you're going to be held accountable for it. Okay, that's the other side of it. You can't scream fire in a theater. Okay, so why should you be able to lie publicly and hurt people without any consequences? That's ridiculous. And it's going to come to an end. Mark my words. It's well on its way with these multi-billion dollar lawsuits and now the Section 230 bill. Okay, so uh, finally, and I'll keep saying this and I'm not going to stop saying this, gambling is for losers, okay? Their loser, the losers are the users of gambling, the municipalities that enable the gambling, and society at large, and the sports leagues themselves whether they realize it or not. They're hurting themselves, they're hurting their fans, and they're hurting the public at large. I will not let this go. That is a fact. I can prove it mathematically. I can improve it. I can improve, uh, show you through examples that it is for losers. Everyone loses except for the operators. That's it. Only the operators profit. Everyone else loses. Zach said this at our parties several times from the podium. You don't see your name on the side of the casino, do you? So get the picture. Stop betting, start investing. Stop betting, start investing. That's what we're about. So if you find this interesting, please share it, uh, rate and review, and uh, subscribe if you want to be notified for the uh, when each episode comes out. And the show notes will have uh, additional resources as they come online and anything that's pertinent uh, at the time. Thank you and enjoy the Super Bowl today. Bye now.